Welcome everyone, it's a pleasure to present to you today. My name is Robert Crawford and I work in the Melbourne School of Design or the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. And um, we have a team of people that work uh, around the environmental performance of uh, buildings in particular, um, looking at material level all the way up to city and neighbourhood scale. Um, and my work spans across those areas. Um, today, what I will be um, talking about is the EPIC database and resource hub, um, particularly around the, the data that is contained within that database. Now, EPIC stands for Environmental Performance in Construction. What I'll be doing today is basically uh, explaining what EPIC is, um, going through some of the background that sort of led us to this point, uh, and some of the intricacies and the, the benefits of EPIC, how it can be used. So when we think about the environmental performance of our built environment, uh, the projects that you yourselves will be working on, um, whether they're buildings, infrastructure projects or whatever, um, we, we tend to focus on the operational performance of those projects. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this, and, and that's uh, because our regulations require us to predominantly focus on those aspects. They're, the, they're basically the only parts that are generally regulated. Uh, they're also the low-hanging fruit. They're the things that um, people are most familiar with, whether it's users of buildings, uh, designers of buildings, engineers, whatever it might be. Uh, and therefore, we tend to focus on improving our buildings from an operational perspective, and we have for, for many, many years. Um, the other aspects of the building life cycle are often neglected. Um, one of the reasons for this is also because they're, they've traditionally been considered to be quite insignificant. And today we're going to be focusing on not just life cycle assessment, but as a, a key part of the life cycle of a project being the embedded or the embodied aspect. So the things that um, go into ma making a, a material or a project before you actually start using it. And the focus of the EPIC database is really on um, the product stage, as you can see here. So according to the international standards, EN15978, um, product stage covers A1 to A3, so the manufacturer of construction materials essentially uh, in the context of construction projects. This part of the life cycle has been considered to be 10% you know, or less of the total resources required to um, procure a building from throughout its entire life cycle, um, production of uh, materials, construction, operation, end of life. Um, more recently, that knowledge has changed as we've delved into it more. We've got better methods for quantifying embedded um, resources required to manufacture materials and buildings. Uh, and we're getting a better understanding now that it actually is a much more significant component of the life cycle resource demands and environmental impacts of a construction project. This is just an example of, of that and showing you the significance of the embodied energy in this case of the life cycle energy for a particular um, house project uh, located in Melbourne. And you can see here that you know it's around about uh, for this particular project 50-50 thereabouts um, operational versus embodied and I'm talking about embodied through initial materials required for construction but also the materials associated with replacement throughout the life of a building of over 50 years or so. As we uh, in significantly improve the operational performance of our buildings and we go down the track of um, passive house standard and things like that, where we're really driving down operational energy demands, that embodied component is becoming even much more significant, even more important that we actually do something about it and we look at it uh, in much more detail than we currently do. Um, it is not regulated in Australia whatsoever. Um, there are voluntary standards that we can that we can look at and use to minimise embodied impacts of our buildings, but um, it's not regulated like it is in some other countries around the world. Uh, now, when we think about trying to minimise the embodied energy, embodied water, embodied emissions, whatever it might be, associated with our buildings and our construction materials, and there are a number of different sources where we can get that data from to help us understand how they perform and make choices that allow us to minimise those impacts as much as possible. Um, one of the more common and emerging um, sources of, is um, what we call EPDs, or Environmental Product Declarations. And uh, they are not as common in Australia as they are internationally. Um, they're quite a large thing in, in Europe and the US in particular, uh, emerging more and more so in Australia. But they are more a rarity amongst the products we produce here than, than, a, than a common um, thing that's available. Uh, and they basically tell us from a manufacturing perspective how much uh, energy we use to produce a particular product, how much emissions are released, how much water is used, um, what are the sort of physical raw materials required, and things like that. There are databases that exist internationally as well that provide that information. They're typically generic type databases, so production of steel in a particular country, for example, production of timber in a particular country, 
Um, they don't necessarily always relate to a particular manufacturer or manufacturing a particular product. Um, so it becomes, starts to become a bit more generic. Um, and another source of data that we can use to help understand the embodied uh, impacts associated with our buildings and our materials is um, co what we call coefficients. And they might be in the form of embodied energy coefficients, for example. And they're a really quick and easy way of getting an understanding of the potential embodied impact associated with our materials or our projects. Uh, and that's essentially what EPIC makes available. Uh, now, the, the issue with a lot of the data that does exist already is there are a number of exclusions. Um, and this is one of the unique benefits of EPIC, which I will go into a little bit more shortly. Um, but some of the typical exclusions with the data that does exist in these sort of life cycle inventory databases or EPDs that are available are the, the environmental impacts associated with things like the manufacture of capital equipment and machinery. Uh, for example, harvesting timber requires um, a number of different types of machinery, whether it be chainsaws, logging trucks, transportation trucks, and things like that. Um, and even in the, the mill where the timber's milled, there's a whole lot of machinery that's required there. Uh, and, and often the energy associated, for example, with manufacturing this machinery isn't accounted for in the data that we've got available um, in EPDs, for example. It's just quite difficult to, to quantify in the way that we um, collect data for things like EPDs. Supporting services. So the, the companies that are responsible for manufacturing materials, they require services from the, the broader economy. Uh, it might be finance, insurance, um, research and development, marketing, a whole range of different services from the services sector of the economy. Um, and there are environmental impacts associated with the provision of those services. And so we can actually allocate some of those environmental impacts to every company that requires those services, including the companies that manufacture our building materials. Um, and those things are very rarely included in this type of data. Uh, and then sometimes the, um, uh, or quite often, the conversion of raw materials into fabricated products can be excluded as well. And that might be raw steel, rolls of steel ingots, for example, into fabricated um, steel beams, columns, um, angles, sections, and so forth. Um, not always, but sometimes these things are, are excluded. Now, EPIC is a uh, Australian government funded research project that was conducted between the University of Melbourne and the University of New South Wales. It, was, it occurred over a four year period, culminating in the release of the database at the end of last year. And it was led by myself and five other experts uh, in the field of life cycle assessment with a combined 60 years experience in this field. Uh, we have people with um, backgrounds in architecture, construction, life cycle assessment, uh, economic modelling, and, and so forth. The EPIC database itself covers three main environmental flows. So if we talk about life cycle assessments, there's a range of different environmental flows and then resultant impacts that we can look at. There are varying uh, degrees of data available and accessible on these different environmental flows. The three that we have the most accessible data on are energy, water and greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of that data comes from our national accounts and also the, the, the data that comes from our manufacturers of construction materials. So they're the three key flows that are covered within the EPIC database. Um, there are others that we considered and that we have data on, but they're not currently available, such as the flow of raw materials, flow of different pollutants uh, and so forth. Now, the EPIC database contains material coefficients across these three flows for 89 unique materials. Um, there are also 195 material and product variations within this. Um, so it gives us over 250 different um, coefficients for each flow, a total of 852 individual coefficients. And we have about over 40 million data points um, associated with that. So it's extremely data rich. Um, we are able to actually drill down into individual materials to identify uh, particular processes associated with those materials uh, and the flows associated with those processes, um, such as the production of steel uh, across its supply chain or, or concrete or glass or, and so forth. Um, the database itself is uh, split up into eight different material, raw material categories, as you can see here. So it covers a fairly broad range of materials that are most common in construction. Obviously, we don't cover every single product, and the products uh, are not manufacturer specific necessarily. Okay, they are very generic because we really don't have access to the data from every single manufacturer in the country, unfortunately. 
The database is contained in a hard copy book, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen there. There's a PDF version of that also available and I will share the, um, the URL, the web address for that, uh, accessing that shortly. Uh, but essentially what it contains is a table of all of the coefficients for the three flows, as you can see here, for those um, 250 plus material variations. And there's just two pages of that, a sample of that table there. That's probably the most useful part of the, the database itself. A really good reference for um, understanding the particular embodied flows associated with different materials you might specify in a construction project. Uh, and then a large chunk of that report is actually the individual what we call fact sheets for every single material. So you can see here an example for water-based paint. We have a bit of a description about what that product is. Some of the key characteristics of that product is density uh, and some of the data that sources that we've used to quantify the embodied energy, water and emissions. And on the right hand side we have the actual results of that analysis. We have the coefficients in the round boxes on the right hand side. Um, and then we have a little bit of information about the, the data that's been used to compile those coefficients. And that's really sort of more useful from an academic research uh, perspective, and less so probably from a practitioner's perspective, but it does give you some insight into the, the, the key contributors to those coefficients, um, those top three inputs on the left hand side of that page. Uh, and we do have a lot more data that we can delve into and look at, you know, um, every single process, as I said, to work out where we might be able to help manufacturers improve the environmental performance of their particular products. Now this database, this table in particular, is available in a more dynamic version on the uh, resource hub that we've developed. And so there is the URL there, epicdatabase.com.au. Um, that will give you access to the PDF version of the report, an Excel version of it as well, uh, and this live dynamic um, version where you can actually sort uh, and search for particular materials uh, within that database. Now, uh, I want to talk now a little bit about the uniqueness of this database and why this is actually a step up from existing uh, data that is available and what the benefits of, it, of using it actually are. And when we developed this database, we had three key priorities in mind, and they have become the three unique characteristics of this database. They include completeness, consistency, and transparency. In relation to the completeness of the EPIC database, we have full supply chain coverage. So this is something that no other database of its kind is able to achieve or has been able to achieve. We cover everything up to scope three, so all of the supply chain essentially, looking at every single process associated with the production of a particular material to the factory gate. We use what we call a hybrid life cycle inventory approach. Uh, this is just a particular approach that's part of a life cycle assessment when you're trying to capture data on the environmental performance of materials or products. It's an approach where we actually merge uh, different types of data together to maximise the supply chain coverage. So it allows us to actually achieve that scope 3 coverage that I just spoke about. Uh, and this particular approach isn't new. It's been around for at least 25 years uh, and it's had that much development and um, international peer review and usage um, throughout those years. Just to give you an idea of the significance of this completeness, if we were to use data that we might capture from environmental product declarations, EPDs, um, or existing life cycle inventory databases, on average for Australia, we would only capture 45% of the environmental flows associated with the materials in this database. So that means that we're missing out on average on 55% of the energy flows, the water flows, or the emissions associated with producing um, these materials within our database. Some materials have better coverage than others. We have really good data in Australia on concrete production and steel production in particular. Um, and so the, the, the completeness associated with the data we've got already without doing using the hybrid approach that we've used here is quite good. Other materials like timber, for example, the system boundary completeness is quite poor. And so there's quite a large amount of data that we're actually missing in terms of the total processes required to manufacture timber. Uh, this means that if we were to rely on this type of data alone, process data, that a material like timber would clearly come out much better on a functional unit basis compared to some other materials because we're excluding a lot of the processes needed to actually get that timber to the factory gate. Um, just to give you an idea here um, is that on the left hand side of these two graphs, there's two different materials, concrete and ETFE film. You can see the, the process value on the left hand side, obviously the different values for each material. But the level of completeness is different as well. As you can see for the concrete, the input output data which we used to fill those gaps that existed in that previous graph um, is quite small. 
Whereas for the material on the right hand side, it's quite a large component of it because we are missing a lot of data when we just use manufacturer's data for a material like ETFE film. So what we do is we, we even things up, basically. We make sure that the materials are comparable, not that you would necessarily replace one of these materials for the other in this instance. But we make sure that the supply chain coverage is identical for all materials within the database. And if you don't do that, then any comparisons you make can be extremely misleading. Uh, just to give you an idea of the significance of using this particular hybrid approach, if we were to look at a traditional residential house in Australia, uh, operational energy is identical. So we've kept the thermal performance of the envelope the same. Uh, all the materials are the same. We've just used a different approach to quantify the embodied energy in this case. The top one is process data. So it's just industry-based data. The bottom one is hybrid data. We've actually filled the gaps with national economic data. And you can see here that the value is almost tripled uh, in terms of the embodied energy component. It's now become 39% of the total life cycle energy for this building, compared to only 19% if we use the process approach. Uh, and the use of this hybrid approach has been one of the key reasons why we've got a better understanding about how significant the embodied impacts of our construction projects are. Now the second aspect that is quite unique about this database is the consistency that we've used. The data that we've used to model all materials in the database is consistent. We have sourced data from the OzLCI database, Australian Life Cycle Inventory Database, which is the most comprehensive database for the manufacture of Australian products and the environmental flows associated with them. And that's supplemented obviously with data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics on national accounts and, and other aspects in terms of the national economy and filling the data gaps that we've got uh, with the process data. And the methods that we've used are consistent. So we use that hybrid approach across all materials and, and that's often not what happens in many other databases. Some of the databases will actually have a mixture of different data sources and different methods for compiling the data all in the one. And it makes it really difficult to actually compare materials when you're using data from different sources and using different methods to actually put that data together. So just to, it's something to really be aware of and conscious of. And the third aspect, the, the third unique aspect of EPIC is the fact that uh, everything is open access. All of the, the methods that we've used are made available in an open access format. The data that we've, we've produced within EPIC is all open access as well. Um, all of the metadata, all the data on each in, individual data point in compiling the coefficients is available for anyone to access and use. Um, so there's about 500,000 data points for every single material. Um, and what that does by making that available and having that data is it allows us to actually do some hotspot identification to work out, as I said before, which particular processes within the manufacturer of a product or material are contributing the most to the overall embodied impact of that material. Uh, and we can do sensitivity analysis as well in terms of what happens if we change a process, and use a different, more efficient process in some way in one of the manufacturing stages of a product. Uh, what impact does that have on the reducing the embodied impact of that material? And all the work has been internationally peer reviewed. We had about eight uh, international peer reviewed publications out of this project and the methods used and data used have all been peer reviewed over, as I said, 25 years. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, and really it's about, I guess, relating this back to practice. And the work that I do and the work that we do at the University of Melbourne really focuses on making sure that we're developing tools and, and data that are going to help inform practice and going to help significant improvements in the environmental performance of our built environment. Um, there's no point us producing these sorts of things and they don't get used. And this is really the, the drive to try and make sure that the industry has access to the best available data at the time. Um, so EPIC can be used to obviously compare materials and select materials in a project, um, to quantify the embodied environmental flows of a particular a project, to quantify life cycle environmental flows as well. And I haven't mentioned this so much because I think we probably all know well about the operational performance of our projects and how to quantify that and how to improve that. And so the focus of this presentation has been more on the embodied aspect. But we need to keep in mind that we need to take things um, on board from a life cycle perspective. There is no point looking at the operational side alone, just as there is no point looking at the embodied aspects alone. We need to consider the impact of improvements in each area on each other. For example, if we're going to reduce the embodied energy of a building by reducing the materials in the, the glazing systems, that's going to have an impact on the operational performance of the building because it's likely going to increase the heating and cooling needs. So we need to balance those things across the life cycle of the whole project. And the other use of this project uh, is in compliance with either voluntary or mandatory regulations.